But let me say good morning to Daniel Dazzi, uh, former host of the Super Morning Show, now in London. He's joined us. Daniel, good morning. Good morning, Winston. How are you doing, man? I'm doing fantastic. I hope you're doing fine, too. I'm not bad. You forgot to introduce me as your former employee. Winston <laughs> used to be my general manager. He gave me my first job on radio. Oh, stop that. Stop that. Uh, no, no, it to... was no, no, it wasn't my first job. It was my first news bulletin. Yes, yes. I yes. was Winston Amwell's bench uh, headline yes, news uh, on Sky uh, Power. Uh, stop that. Yeah. Uh, let's let me say good morning to, uh, you know, Kwame Sapawasiyedu. Kwame, good morning. Good morning, Winston. How are you? I am fine. I'm fine. Uh, today we're talking mm -hmm. about a bit of a politics, not about health, uh, but I know it's something you love so much. So let's, let's just listen to. Um, you know, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson, uh, as he resigned. Our brilliant and Darwinian system will produce another leader equally committed to taking this country forward through tough times, not just helping families to get through it, but changing and improving the way we do things, cutting burdens on businesses and families, and yes, cutting taxes, because that is the way to generate the growth and the income we need to pay for great public services. And to that new leader, I say, whoever he or she may be, I say, I will give you as much support as I can. And to you, the British public, I know that there will be many people who are relieved and uh, perhaps quite a few who will also be disappointed. And I want you to know how sad I am to be giving up the best job in the world. But them's the breaks. I want to thank Carrie and our children, and all members of my family who've had to put up with so much for so long. I want to thank the peerless British Civil Service for all the help and support that you have given our police, our emergency services, and of course, our fantastic NHS who at critical moment helped to extend my own period in office. Right, so that's uh, Boris Johnson there. And I'd like to also say that we've been joined by Kweku in Chibwe Siako. Uh, Kweku, good morning, and thank you very much for joining us. Good morning. Great. I'll get to you shortly. Let me start with the journalist and find out from him, uh, Daniel. So uh, tell us the latest. Today, what's the conversation in the UK like following uh, Boris Johnson's resignation? The biggest conversation, Winston, is who's coming next. Um, it's about the race. But let me, since you introduced me as a journalist, let me try and catch anyone who hasn't followed it up on the latest that has happened. Mm. What we just heard was Boris Johnson's resignation, which he announced. The details of that are that next week, the 1922 Committee of the Backbench MPs will set out a timetable for the selection of the new Tory leader. Um, we all know that Boris Johnson resigned well, for a number of reasons, but the key one has been um, what is now called the Chris Pincher affair. His deputy whip in parliament went to a, a private members club and groped a few men, and he resigned as a result. So Mr. Johnson's office was asked whether or not they knew about Chris Pincher's behavior before he was appointed as deputy whip. His office first said he did not know. A number of ministers said he did not know. There was no formal complaint. And then Lord MacDonald, who was a senior, um, a top civil servant, then wrote a letter to Parliament to say that he had lied. And so soon after that, the narrative changed. Soon after the narrative changed, his ministers began to resign. About 59 MPs had resigned as of the time that he was announcing his resignation. So basically what that, the message they were sending was that you can't be our leader, so you can't form a government. So as a result, he decided to resign. Now, it's important that we make note of that because after he announced his resignation, he said that he's going to still be in charge of the country until the Conservative Party chooses a new leader. And we are expecting that that will be done latest by October. Another very key uh, piece of information that I'm going to start explaining. So why did I say his ministers resigning were important? Currently, it's being counted that there are still about 28 junior minister positions that are empty, but Mr. Johnson has formed an interim cabinet to shepherd the affairs of the UK until set time that a new prime minister is selected. 
That interim cabinet actually includes some people who called for his resignation, some people who actually resigned. We know that there are some ministers who resigned and after one day took the position back because now they know that they are only here for an interim, played an interim role, and soon Mr. Johnson himself will be gone. Some of those ministers, including Grant Chaps, for instance, has ha, ha, have put their uh, hat in the ring. Grant Chaps says that he will stand for Tory leader, and he, along with Attorney General Suela Braverman, have said that yesterday I was looking at a YouGov poll, and I was looking at who would be likely to replace Mr. Johnson. Number number one on that list was Defence Secretary Ben Wallace. Penny Mordon, who was trade secretary, his finance minister, uh, minister, sorry, uh, his finance minister, which is Sunak, his foreign minister, police trust are all on it. Since then, Tom Tugendhat has also said he wants to run. Sajid Navid, his health minister, one of the first people to resign, is actually was in the final four of the conservative leader race that Boris Johnson won. Jeremy Hunt was in the final two of the conservative leader race that um, uh, Mr. Johnson won. Initially, his deputy, Dominic Raab, was tipped to replace him. Dominic Raab has said he will not. Michael Gove, who was his leveling up minister, uh, housing and communities minister, also was also being tipped, but he has also said he will not run for Tory leader. So those are the key questions. First of all, what becomes of the British system, who is the next prime minister, and how does Mr. Johnson shepherd this government, lead this country till whichever time that he steps down finally. That is also in question because we know that the Labour side of Parliament, led by Keir Starmer, has threatened that if he does not go immediately, they would trigger another vote of confidence. And But they would need a lot of conservative support. Imagine that the NDC said that they wanted to put a vote of no confidence against President of Kufuadu. They will need a lot of support from the NPP. That's the situation that Keir Starmer will face. However, there have been some members of his party who still want him to leave. I know that Kwesi Kwating, his business minister, for instance, even before Mr. Johnson resigned, he had said that, look, if you're going to go, go immediately. It's more practical. There's, um, I want to get this name right, Lord Hazelheit. He's also, yes, Heseltine, pardon me, Lord Michael Heseltine. He's a former prime minister. And, and, and the former prime minister, Sir John Major, have also said that he should leave immediately. So those are the key questions. Um, how is he going to run government? Is he going to leave now? Who's going to be the next prime minister on Wednesday? Thank you very much, Daniel. Let me bring in uh, Kweku and Kwame at this point. And let's look at um, you know, our own situation because uh, part of the conversation is focused on whether this could ever happen in Ghana. And I've seen uh, you, Kweku, uh, you know, trying to distinguish between the uh, presidential system we run in Ghana and the parliamentary system in UK. But is it not more about principles, Kweku? Um, I agree with you that um, it's about principles. Mm. Um, bottom line is what motivates a person to get into public office? Mm. If the motivation is to serve the people genuinely, then whenever you have a situation, whether it's your personal conduct, uh, conduct of your colleagues or subordinates or anybody else or any situation that prevents you from being able to offer that service, then you, you, you tell yourself, okay, I'm here to serve, but I can't serve because this condition or circumstance has existed. Then, obviously, I have to step down. So that is the distinction. I think I can agree with you and most people that if you look at the motivation for going into public office in Ghana, I, I can say without any doubt that it is not to serve the people. Mm. If it is to serve the people, how come if you cannot serve them for one year, you still hold on to the position? How come you conduct yourself in a way that makes it almost impossible to continue in that job in any other democracy you still want to hold on to that job. It's 
here I can see it's a question of power earns the money, money earns the power. Because you know people can even borrow to go into elections. Yeah. Now tell me, which rational human being will borrow money to enter into a venture unless they are expecting something in return? If you are going to actually serve people, why would you go into debt even before having the chance to serve the people? And that's why when they are contesting, even if, if it's an internal election, there's so much violence. Sometimes, I mean, attack on each other, even deaths, even in, in internal elections, because the motivation is not to go and serve anybody. It is go and serve their personal, parochial, pecuniary interests. And that is what we see here. And that is why they will not resign, no matter what they do. Because you and I know, for instance, elsewhere, if you dip your money in the public purse without parliamentary approval, I mean, you know you're going to resign. And if you're not going to resign, you're going to be fired. As Professor Ishkwet Prempe said, people who know they can't be fired also typically don't re resign. Okay. Because th the boss will not fire the person. You know, so at the core is the motivation for going into public office. And then secondly, whether or not the person will get fired for whatever they do if they don't resign. But I made mention of the differences in the system because here we guarantee them four years. And regardless of what they do, they know their term is secured. Over mm. there and under most parliamentary systems, you are governing with a, a coalition. And if you don't do what the coalition members expect, they can just resign and your government will be brought down. Or you may have to go for early election. Like in Israel, they have had, what, five elections in the past yes. uh, uh, few years. It's because people will resign if you don't meet the standards yeah, that who... you have set for yourself mm. or you have set for the coalition. Okay. So that, that, I think, is the difference. But it won't happen here, quite frankly, under this current system. Okay, I mean, while you're talking about the parliamentary system, I mean, we've seen uh, Tony Blair, uh, you know, at the time when he resigned in 2007, uh, Gordon Brown took over. They didn't have to go for another election, uh, even when Theresa May resigned. Uh, you know, Boris Johnson took over. Yes, then he called for elections. Yes, you can do that. Uh, that's the difference. Uh, in our system also, a president can resign, the vice president takes over. So it's a bit of a provision made for that. But you say that is never going to happen in this country. Let me get to uh, Kwame Sapo and say, do Kwame, you share the same view that it can't happen in Ghana? Um, thanks, Winston. Yes, um, good morning to you listeners and um, to my fellow panelists. I share a similar view, mm -hmm. but I come from a different um, view. Okay. You realize that um, Kweku makes reference to Israel, a country where I grew up in, actually. So I understand what they do there in the Knesset. Yeah. But they never have, ever since Golda Meir, they've never had any party that has been able to dominate the Knesset and have an absolute majority. Simon Perez had it for a short period of time, but even then, his, uh, what do you call it, attorney general resigned, which then triggered a general election because there was a corruption scandal. The question you ask is, irrespective of the model, would people go by their principle and say, this is against what I stand for, so I would do the dignified thing to preserve my own um, what do you call it? Brain. We don't do that in Ghana. Mm. That's one of the things that we don't do in Ghana. Okay. But, but I mean, yes, it's something we don't do in Ghana, but the question is, can we get to that level? Today, we don't do it, but will there ever be a time when we can take those decisions in Ghana? Uh, well, I think we've lost, uh, you know, we've lost uh, Kwame. Uh, 
uh, let me get to uh, Kweku on phone. Yes, Kweku, uh, yes. you say this is not going to happen in Ghana, but do you ever foresee this view of yours changing? Would you ever get to the time when Ghanaians can do this? You see, it, it's not about the nature of the Ghanaian. It is about the motivation for going into public office mm. and respecting the people that you claim you want to serve. If we get to the point where people's motivation for going into politics is not about their personal, private gain, but the general public good, then people will, be, will come to that point where if their circumstances are such that they can't fulfill that public good, then they accept that they are of no use remaining in that position. And that is where that principle comes in, because your purpose, your object of being there is to serve. If you are not in the position to serve for whatever reason, then you back out and allow somebody else who will be able to serve the people. Because after all, your interest is for the people to be served. So whether it is you or another person, so long as the people are being served, that should make you happy. And that is why elsewhere you find people who say, okay, look, my family commitments are putting too much pressure on my ability to perform in my role. So even as a Supreme Court judge in the U.S., Sandra De O'Connor say, I need to go take care of my sick husband. So she resigns. Somebody else who works for the Pentagon says, I need to spend more time with my family in spite of my high-profile job, so I resign. Why is Ajua Safu saying because of her sick son, she cannot resign and take care of her son, but she will hold on to her position? It's because she is in the position for her personal interest. I mean, you say you, you love your constituents. But apparently, you don't love them so much as to follow the news that goes on in Ghana. So even when Parliament says, we've sent you know, a letter to your constituency office, apparently, you don't get back to your constituency office to be able to know. Okay. You don't know anything that is going on, even though I mean, you're supposed to love your constituencies still, even as you are in the U.S. So the point is this. We will get to that point where there will be a new breed of politicians who go in, not for what they can get for themselves, their family and their clique, but for what the people that they claim to serve really need. And they will be in public service to serve the people. And when it gets to that point, you will have people resigning on principle because the situation arises where they can no longer serve, but they would want the people to be served, and so they will resign. Okay. Here, we, they protect each other because it's a clique, and they all have the same interests, mm. the same personal, parochial, pecuniary interests. They all share, so they protect each other. Otherwise, I mean, it's strange. You mentioned the issue about um, the COVID time when the, the, the health minister committed Ghana under those bizarre circumstances. Yes. I mean, look at what happened under uh, Bush during the uh, uh, Katrina, Hurricane Katrina issue. The boss of FEMA, because of the criticism that the people were not satisfied with his performance, he resigned. We are in a crisis, and the minister commits us to this kind of uh, uh, contract in this bizarre situation. And yet, overnight, you have chiefs and opinion leaders all flooding uh, the, the presidency to beg on his behalf. And then, as you know, everybody is protecting him and backing him up, and he's still in the office. Okay. Let me get to uh, Kwame uh, Sapuansiedu. Uh, Kwame, you're making a point before we lost you. Please continue, and then let me um, wrap it up with my final yeah. question. Yes, I was, I was saying that that ethical standpoint is lost on us. And it is lost on us because of our socio-cultural connotations, like Kweku just said. That when you become a minister or a member of parliament or a president, 
you represent yourself primarily, but you represent a constituency culturally. So you would see that the example of the health minister, the paramount chief of the area would most likely go and beg and horse trade to say, oh, if you take him out of the cabinet, um, my area has lost out at the seat of ultimate decision making. Mm. So that person who is making that social cultural horse trading is not thinking about the principle of serving the people and living up to the tenets of our laws. Because the person who's going to plead is not even asking the fundamental question, have our laws been broken? And if they have been broken, does this person deserve to be in public office? It's more about my area. You can see the same, you, you go, people would go, it's more about my church, he's my church member. Or it's more about my social environment. He belongs to the Lions Club, or he belongs to, um, what do you call it, um, Rotary or stuff like that. Sure. So there is so much sociocultural frowning on resigning. It's easier for people to say it when it's not their family member or their parent or their someone who comes from their paramounty or their party member. But the minute it comes close to home, and if you want to see these things, Winston, I'll conclude this way. Just look at the tweets from 2013 to 2016, especially in 2015, that were made by key Ghanaians regarding Ghana's going to the IMF and just to post them with how they speak today when people say the finance minister should resign. Mm. You would realize that in 2015, it was too far away from their comfort zone so they could speak about the ethics of resignation. In 2016, the pigeons have come home to roost, and therefore, there must be an explanation, like Carl Tufor said, I was listening to you earlier, to the fundamental question. The Ghanaian doesn't answer the question, gives an explanation. So now, suddenly, they've stopped being the ethical police of Ghana's decisions to the justifications of why this time, the same IMF they frown upon is acceptable. So you do all these things, and you ask yourself, Look at Boris Johnson. Who was the first person who told Boris Johnson you need to go? It's Michael Gove. Check the relationship between Michael Gove and Boris Johnson. Check um, the, what happened between um, Sunak, who was then the Chancellor of the Exchequer, and when Nadim Zahawi took over. The minute Zahawi was employed, what did he say? He said, well, you need to go anyway. You understand me? Because giving him the chancellorship didn't cloud his ethical judgment. Yes, you've promoted me, but I still stand by my word that based on your behavior, your position has become untenable. We don't do things like that. If in Ghana, a president promoted a minister who had a view that said the president must go, that minister would take the promotion as a pat on the back and say, well, I'm not going to talk any longer. Hmm. Or the family member of the sociocultural circle would tell him, hey, now when you promote you, that sort of thinking and that is why we don't resign and that is the point i'm trying to make well kwame uh thank you very very much for joining us uh, thank you also uh, and thank you daniel dazi for joining us we're very grateful that you made time to be with us